My name is David Patrick Brown. I am the CEO of David Brown Automotive. I was born in Knaresborough, a small market town in North Yorkshire, in the north of England, to parents who were timber leaders. They would chop down trees and take them to the sawmills. My earliest recollections uh, have been involved in all of that. So I would wake up to the sound of tractors starting or not starting, as was more often the case. I had a great time growing up amongst all that. And still today, I just started taking my grandson to uh, the classic tractor events. It's brilliant. One of the uh, earliest memories I have of my father actually out in the field, literally, was pulling trees out of uh, various places. And often the tree would get stuck on the winch rope and you would allow the front of the tractor you were sat on to rear up into the air, dip the clutch, and as the tractor came down, you'd release the clutch again and gave all that extra leverage and more often than not would pull the tree over whatever it was stuck on. But one day the clutch didn't work and the tractor continued and fell over back on top of him, breaking his back and trapping him underneath. It resulted in a long period in hospital while he recovered and it was during his time in hospital that he actually became a designer. He designed himself a crane while he was in hospital and the whole idea of the crane was it would stop the back breaking problems. Exhibited at one of the local shows in Yorkshire, was offered a job as a, an engineer for a company in Leeds. Like myself, my father was also called David Brown. When he was a younger man, before we started our own companies, he also used to build tractors, designing either mines tractors, earth moving equipment or agricultural tractors. The biggest change was a, a trip down to Gloucestershire when I was about nine. While he was there, he was the managing director of a company called Muirhill and designed a complete range of uh, both agricultural vehicles and earth moving vehicles for them. My weekends were spent testing prototypes in various states of anxiety as we would find out what grades they would travel up before it finally slithered back down the slope or on one occasion stood in the wheel of the tractor trying to stop it from tipping over as we traversed a sideways slope. After many years of working for other people my father decided in about 1972 to start his own business. That business was called DJB Engineering, which were his initials, based in the northeast of England. I was the first employee, not because of any skills I had, but because I was actually very cheap at that stage. This company was set up to produce off-highway articulated dump trucks, a combination of an agricultural and an earth-moving machine, effectively joined together. So the idea was quite revolutionary at the time. We received four Queen's Award for industry, three for export and one for design innovation. We also received many awards, local awards for employment practices. We were a really great company to work for, particularly at a time when a lot of the country was in recession. Cutting a lot of stories very, very short, that business was extremely successful. The product was exactly the right product at exactly the right time. We were the most profitable company of its kind in the world, let alone the UK. We had three and a half thousand people working for us and we had products that were receiving international recognition. Whilst we called ourselves a manufacturing business, we were also a marketing business, we were a sales business. We provided aftercare throughout the world. So putting all these things together into a completely rounded business and a business that could give the customer what he wanted was something that I learned very much and sometimes the hard way as we created those companies from nothing. About 10, 12 years after we started the business, we acquired some other businesses. We acquired, for example, Bedford Trucks from General Motors. Um, still, again, as a family business. And uh, various other companies, uh, some overseas, some in the UK, they were all engineering based and the bulk of the products were all to do with big, heavy trucks. We ended up in a partnership with Caterpillar where they did some branding work and sold the product. We continued to manufacture and design and the product became so successful that eventually Caterpillar had to buy us. At this stage, I was running the company and had been for five years or so and we had a product range that was not just the original articulated dump truck 
but was also telescopic material handlers, normal on highway trucks, specialist military vehicles, all-wheel drive systems, fuel systems, a massive range of products and still the business was family owned. To this day with the products that we design, Caterpillar still make an evolutionary version of the revolutionary product that we made. So today that product is massively accepted on construction, on motorway sites, on all sorts of different applications throughout the world. Running the manufacturing businesses um, under their various different names and different products taught me a great deal about manufacturing itself. The advantages of those companies, particularly as they apply to what I'm doing today at David Brown Automotive, is they were all relatively low volume compared to the mass production environment of a major car company. The philosophies that go with low volume manufacture are really important to recognize and that you can do things in a completely different way, produce the same products at the end, but using techniques that are totally different. After I sold the businesses to Caterpillar, I retired for two weeks, then quickly thought I've got a lot to do here. I either started or acquired many different businesses, but mainly in the lifestyle sector. I had a house building company, Harley Davidson dealerships, a chain of ladies shoe shops, some men's clothing shops, again a small chain of those, restaurants, nightclubs and bars, all the things that in many respects I was a customer of. So I went back into those businesses and I created them, but with the overriding and slightly pompous belief that I could do better than anybody else. And to an extent I did. For example, one of the uh, shops I had a small department store in Yarm. We won the uh, department store of the year award and that year we shared that award with Selfridges. So we were doing a good job. I know that I'm entrepreneurial uh, because so many people have told me but it never actually feels that that's what you're doing. It just feels that you're doing the right thing. So if you have a passion for something and the knowledge and ability to make it happen that's what I love to do. Before talking about David Brown Automotive, the other businesses that I've created since selling the lifestyle businesses are again about adding value. So in the north of England, I have a brewing company called Brewing and Distilling Company, Badco for short. We produce award-winning beers um, inspired by various styles, almost from across the world. We sell these beers into Michelin star restaurants, in fact, the world's best restaurant, which isn't too far from where I live in Yorkshire, stocks the beer. But so do many supermarkets. And it's really nice to be able to bring what was quite a small uh, market uh, refined for these craft beer drinkers and bring it out in so that it's available for tens of thousands of people instead of just a few. All of the companies I'm involved in uh, push the boundaries in terms of design and manufacture. Another company of mine is Lapiceda, based in the north of England, and that produces some of the finest stone floors and wall surfaces that you can buy. But it also machines things to create beautiful works of art using, again, a combination of technology, but with hand craftsmanship to bring these things to a completion. A few years ago, I decided that uh, since my brother had competed quite successfully rally driving, that I was going to have a cause. I was much older at this stage, though, so I started off in the relative luxury of Group N Championship uh, with a Subaru. In the second year, I won the championship, so it wasn't quite as good as I thought I was in the first year, but I learnt. I then built a car of my own, which was uh, a Ford Puma shell with World Rally car components in it, and that was a fantastic car. I loved that car. Really, really quick, but also I found it really easy to drive. I've started to uh, compete on endurance rallies, so rallies from Peking to Paris, which uh, was a nine-week rally in an old Rolls-Royce Phantom II 1927 which in Beijing, before we set off, would easily have won the award for the most unsuitable car for the rally. But when we got to Paris, it was the most beautiful as we drove down the Champs-Élysées. 
even though most of it was held together with string. Since doing that rally, I've really got into these endurance rallies and I've gone from Singapore up through Malaysia, Thailand, into Burma to Mandalay. Great events that just are genuinely about enduring, mainly a navigator. About 15 years ago, something like that, I was on a classic car rally in the south of France and uh, my best friend had loaned me his Ferrari Daytona convertible to do the rally in. And I was so looking forward to it. It was a car of my young adult dreams was this car. I picked it up uh, near Nice Airport, got into it and was immediately and massively unimpressed. Um, heavy steering, brakes that were by any stretch of the imagination poor. Underpowered as well. You wouldn't think a Ferrari even from that period was, but it is. Anyway, drove it for about a day and a half and then mercifully it got stuck in second gear and I could not get it out of second gear so I had to abandon it. But I didn't want to miss out on the rally so I went and hired a little Peugeot and uh, followed the rally in this car. And this Peugeot had air conditioning, power steering, brakes that worked for radio and the other people in the other classic cars, because it was red hot, all wanted to borrow the Peugeot and they wanted to pretend that they would like to give me the opportunity of driving their classic car but in fact they simply wanted to cool down and listen to the radio. I came away from that rally thinking wouldn't it be nice to combine the um, the style of the 60s, the 70s, early 70s with um, a contemporary powertrain and all the things that you take for granted. This I guess is where my engineering and manufacturing experience from the past became relevant because I could see how you could do that in low volumes and still produce a beautiful thing. Ever since I was a small child I've been involved in vehicles of all descriptions from the logging tractors that I first remember seeing in my father's timber yard first thing in the morning through to some of the world's top most luxurious cars. I love vehicles. I love them of any description. So it is a dream come true in so many ways to be able to put all that experience from the past into producing what I think are some of the world's most beautiful cars. It's very easy to enjoy a classic car and uh, there is something about motoring in that style which uh, I still enjoy and I enjoy it very, very much. But I'm prepared to get my hands dirty, I'm prepared to crawl underneath it, I'm prepared to fix it and I'm prepared for it to go wrong because it will go wrong and they can go wrong in little ways or massive ways. But when I decided to uh, start to build a car it was to put all of those things right. My experience of starting businesses and starting new businesses is significant. I've started 30 businesses from scratch and each of those I've grown and built up and each of those has in its own way been successful. So starting a company to make a car was no big deal as far as I was concerned. It was something that I'd done before in different forms and in different ways. My vision for Speedback GT at the very outset was a retro inspired shape with contemporary underpinnings that was in itself and through its design a genuine Grand Tourer. So something that had an awful lot of luggage space, usable luggage space, was extremely comfortable, was equally at home uh, in the middle of a city as it would be on an autobahn and was a very, very comfortable long distance tourer. I employed a designer um, who helped me create the shape I wanted and that shape was inspired by all those things from the 60s. And so we produce a car in clay, we tweak it, we shape it, everybody has a little play with a curve and everybody enjoys putting the clay on, I did. We actually then covered that car in a product called Dynoc, which is a coloured cling film, and dragged it out into the sunlight because one of the most important things is the real world reflections that, that happen just outside as a consequence of a tree moving or somebody walking by it. And then the most important thing we did then was to measure it. So uh, we digitally measured every square half a millimetre of its surface and then we have this digital representation of what the car is going to be. Once we have the digital information that we need, we can then do what we want with that. So 
again, you know, the object of the exercise was to get uh, contemporary performance with traditional styling. So we then need to look for, and we did, a platform that would give us that from an engineering point of view, and then to marry the two things together. But this time, instead of as they used to do with a tape measure and a, and a pencil, we can do that digitally. And in doing that digitally, we get, for example, great panel fits on our car. There are many luxury cars that are hand-finished, but Speedback GT is hand-built, and the differences are massive. First of all, the body is all hand-rolled using traditional techniques of rolling the metal on the English wheel. Once that shape starts to be formed, we then use the digital information that we recorded earlier to make sure that the shape is absolutely as we require it. But that combination of yesterday's skills and today's technology is a beautiful way of producing a beautiful product. A lot of the components on the outside and inside of the car, the individual detail parts, are uh, hand produced from solid ingots of aluminium which are then chromed. There are 8,000 man hours that are going into producing a Speedback GT. When we paint the Speedback GT's body. That process is eight weeks long as we ensure that everything is absolutely perfect before the top coat of paint goes onto the car. The veneers in Speedback GT are a great example of a combination of traditional skills and contemporary ways of manufacture and measuring. So the veneers are hand applied onto the substrates in a very traditional way, but the substrates themselves are compound in their curves, and consequentially we get a, a really beautiful looking piece of traditional type materials, but presented in a very, very different contemporary way. When we launched the car, it was a fantastic time, ever so proud. It's not every day you end up doing something like that, and not many people in the world that will do. So it was a great day for us all, and we had a, immediately a, a fantastic reaction from both potential customers, customers and the press. Great time. It was launched pretty much as a working prototype. We then spent the next year engineering and perfecting all of the detail to make sure that we could accurately and with fantastic quality reproduce it. People who are buying the Speedback GT are buying a, a very unique car. There will only ever be a hundred of them made. Uh, they are buying a handcrafted, um, unique piece of motoring history in many respects. Um, but on the other hand, it is eminently serviceable. It is a practical car. It can be looked after anywhere. So it is a, a, a very unique offering in that respect. One of the... Uh, proudest moments of the history of the company was delivering uh, the first production car to our first customer. And uh, that was a, a moving time for the whole company. Mini Remastered came about as a desire to get an additional product into the company. We'd done a great job of developing the brand and we were becoming well known throughout the world um, but we needed a, a, an additional product and the company had established some values those being the value of uh, beautiful uh, British craftsmanship uh, we wanted to apply that to another vehicle. My father always described the Mini to me as being one of the most brilliantly engineered cars but one of the most badly manufactured cars and uh, looking at its iconic uh, status within the British car industry, we wanted to take that car and bring it up to a very contemporary standard, um, but also to improve on all the manufacturing deficiencies that had existed uh, from the day it was born. I'm sure that the word nippy was invented to describe the way in which uh, a Mini will drive and handle. And we didn't want to move away from that, so we retained all of the original designs for the uh, engine and the transmission along with the suspension and all of its various components. 
um, we put a new ECU to manage the engine better and to make sure that it is more uh, contemporary in terms of the way in which it performs. But our emphasis was really been on uh, the finish and the materials, both on the exterior with paintwork that is uh, very similar to the Speedback GT in terms of how it's applied, and the choice of some of the finest hides for the interior, along with our own design of dashboard with the implementation of power steering, air conditioning, and uh, a Bluetooth sat-nav system. We moved to Silverstone to a brand new facility uh, to bring all of our activities together. Um, a great 18,000 square feet brand new factory unit. And within that facility we have everything the customer would need to see in order to specify their vehicle. But including and especially a great customer specification room. Now in that room are all samples of our leathers, our paint colours, our detail of specification. I think anywhere that involves the customer in the whole selection and design process is a great feeling to have. It's something that we massively encourage with anyone who is thinking of buying a car to come to the facility and participate in its creation. Buying and specifying one of our cars should be a fun uh, time. We have a great customer portal uh, people can use to watch the development and build progress of their car. So the involvement in from ordering the car to receiving the car is a continuous process. And during that period, we welcome the customer's input. The Speedback Silverstone edition was produced to mark our anniversary of moving to Silverstone. Uh, Silverstone itself is an old RAF base before it became a racetrack. And we wanted to take inspiration from the fighter jets that operated in the 60s. Um, our wheel design, for example, looks like the air intake from the English Electric Lightning. Uh, the leather choice inside is similar to the Martin Baker ejector seat that was fitted to those, uh, those aircraft. We also increased the horsepower to 601 and uh, changed the suspension setup to give a slightly firmer ride than the original car. I'm very lucky to have around me a talented team of uh, people in every aspect of our company's business. Uh, but we're also lucky to have some great suppliers that we work with, people with real heritage and skills, craftsman skills. The future of the company will continue to embody those things that the brand stands for, and the brand is standing for. Reimagine products from the past using the finest British craftsmanship materials and uh, excellent and fitting design. We put our customers at the forefront of everything we do. Everything we do is aimed at them. We want the people to, as we say, enjoy the journey. Life is a journey. Specifying the car in the first instance, watching it being built on the portal, and then ultimately, and obviously, enjoying every element of its ownership, but particularly the journey.